What was your question? Can I come in? No, we were just generally talking. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm... You talk quite... Uh, you know that loud, so I'll hold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, actually, what are you trying to do? Uh, yeah, go on. I'm actually not religious. I have no belief in God. Yeah. I have belief in energy and present happiness. So living in the present, not aiming for a goal that is unreachable and unattainable and unknowledgeable. Yeah. So it's just really interesting just to... What made you come to your belief? Like, What, what made you reach that conclusion that you've reached? I was Mormon. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I love the sense of community, but there was just something fabricated. It felt fabricated to me. It felt man-made. It felt non-believable. What part of it felt fabricated? Um, that it doesn't relate to what I'm living in presently. Maybe that's just something selfish. I'm, I'm yeah. all up for believing that we are individual people and we all need something a little bit different to help us reach our present happiness. If you need that belief, and I'm not patronizing in any way, no, 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 if you not, need that I'm belief that, that there is something out there for you to obtain mm. and that makes you presently happy in this moment, I'm like, yes, you use that's that good, yeah? to help you okay. live your full life. When you say you believe in energy though, what's, what do you actually believe about energy? Energy is a construed term because energy could mean uh, chemical reactions which is just scientific yeah. you have your elements that hit each other yeah. and that creates a form of energy so is that what you're talking about or? potentially okay. I've not quite explored it it Fair could enough. potentially mean a spiritual meaning meaning okay. that there is an energy out there which not necessarily hand picks something like that is going to happen or I'm going to create this being uh, but it could mean that there is something subconsciously all happening like fate almost yeah, yeah. let me ask you a serious question do you believe you have a purpose, an ultimate purpose in life? Uh, no. Okay. So, your being in this world... Is accidental. Is accidental. Okay. And your, your purpose is a subjective purpose. Happiness. Yeah, which is happiness. That's the goal for me. Okay. Now, let's start from the beginning, I think. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Randomness. Accidents. Can you prove to me that they exist? Accidents. Accidents and randomness. Can I prove to you they exist? Yeah. Randomness. I mean, there's an interesting theory in philosophy. Yeah? I was just recently looking into it. It's called chaos theory. But the idea is this. First and foremost, randomness. The idea of something which is random, which is accidental. It seems to me like a convenient way that human beings use, or a convenient label that human beings use, to describe that which they don't understand. Okay. So if I say that, if I get a bunch of numbers and I say, well, this is just a random bunch of numbers. Sure, I know what you mean. That means I don't understand the relationship between the bunch of numbers so in question. what I'm thinking of straight away is when Darren Brown managed to predict the lottery. Because the lottery is supposed to be Random. Well, I mean, numbers, that, therefore, yeah. it cannot be random. So I agree with you. If yeah. somebody can do it and Fine. they can pluck out specific numbers, sure, I agree. Yeah. What's even more incredible is is the design. Uh -huh. Is is this? Well, I would say perceived design. Yeah, and there is a perceived design. Once again, if you're talking about this from a first-person subjective experience, it's no doubt in any cosmologist's mind that this universe is fin finely tuned. Okay, yeah. Okay. When I say finely tuned, we're talking about it allows for any life to exist in it, any kind of life to exist. And you'll find that all of the forces, because you were talking about energy, all of the forces like the, the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, and these constants are finely tuned. Had they been any different, this universe would not exist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Sure. So my question to you is, is as follows. How can, you, how can you account for that? How can I account for something being so finely tuned? How can you account for the reality that we see around us of design? The reality of design? I mean, we're living presently. Yeah. We have no concept of what happened 100 million years ago. Because yeah. we have no account for Fine. If, so if, therefore, we yeah. cannot compare what we have currently to what was before. Because that might have been completely different. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing you don't believe in evolution. Well, I mean, it depends on how you define evolution. Okay. 
evolution is a valid scientific, if you're talking about Darwinian evolution, it's a valid scientific model for the data, the biological and the fossil record data. Well, that's a 21st century construct. Okay. And, and science, as we know from the philosophy of science, is, is a constantly evolving thing. Right. And just like we had steady state theory and now we have Big Bang cosmology, it's possible that we have today a neo-Darwinian evolution, but tomorrow we'll have something else. And in fact, neo Lamarckian evolution is taking, uh, it's putting its um, mark in the biological world. So that's, that's my, my, my stance on evolution. It's a valid scientific model, but it's not an ultimate truth. Okay, so it's only valid for the 21st century. Come 22nd century, we'll find something different. We don't know if we'll find something different or not, but it's, we have problems of induction in science generally. So we can't generalize all of science or the future record or how science will be in the, fu in the future with today's findings. In fact, with something really interesting one of my friends told me about, was that actually, according to Henry Gee, Henry Gee was one of the, um, the writers of Nature magazine. I think he, was, he had like a Nature magazine as well, probably the most prestigious um, journal on, uh, on evolution, scientific enterprise and stuff. And he said that we don't have 99, more than 99% of uh, the fossil record. We don't have more than 99% of that information. So we're, our um, assumptions about, for example, the theory of evolution is based on literally that one percent. So you're making a generalization, and we're making as a, like the scientific community is making a generalization on the one percent. But what we say about the theory of evolution is neither here nor there because we're here the idea of design, yeah. as I said to you before, is perceived. Okay. My so I was talking about somebody recently. We were talking about the idea of beginning. So evolution obviously has process it happens right in your in any religion there's a beginning mm. what's your concept of beginning because if there's a beginning for example christianity with adam and eve that was the beginning that happened from them from the decisions created good evil mm. humanity is there a concept of beginning is that in, it? is that in islam because i'm muslim so in islam we do have a concept of beginning first and foremost if you want to talk about beginning there was, there's a, basically, just to kind of give you, because um, I'm going to be using terms, right? So, we believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran, yeah, the Sunnah is the, the, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, the words of his, his words, which we say he also revealed from, was revealed to him from God. That's our contention, right? So, in the Sunnah, there's a hadith. A hadith is a saying, yeah? Which says, Can Allah wa lam yakun shay. So, there was God and there was nothing with him. There was nothing else there. So the absolute beginning... Okay, already that's contradicted so many things. Okay, go ahead. So straight away, all I can think of is this guy that mentioned at the beginning, the word was God, right? Yeah, yeah. So contradiction straight away. Say that again. There's nothing with yeah. God at the beginning, yeah. but then there is word with God at the beginning. Okay, what yeah. Is no, that's what a good question. What is God? What is the beginning? What is God? Very good. Why is word lies? I think I think the the word with you're right about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a seeming contradiction. So here I would answer it in the following way. I'll say to you, the and the word was with God, and the word was God is the Bible, not the Quran, first and foremost. Okay, but going back, it's come from the same place. Somebody who stood here, gone, yeah. mentioned that it came from the same person, Angel Gabriel. Yeah, yeah, I understand. The word comes from the same person. So if yeah. it comes from the same person, it right. should be the same word. So, it's one more thing. The biblical text, we don't believe, is fully intact. So we believe parts of it are true and parts of it are not true. How do we, just, how do we decide that what was true? Okay, so we believe that, just, uh, we'll come to it, but... Put it, can we put it as an asterisk and we'll come to Sorry, it? Yeah. yeah, we'll come to it. So okay. just, just to let you know, for, for the purpose of coming, like, because we're building at the moment, incrementally, I'll definitely mention the answer to that question. But the reason why, in a nutshell, really, is we believe that the Quran sift all of the things that came before it in terms of uh, corrupted things, things that have been omitted from the corpus, from the revelatory corpus, and things that have been put into it, inserted into it. And that was why there was a need for the Quran, because it's the final testimony, it's the final testament. Uh, I thought the Quran was the direct word of God. It was, yeah. It is, yeah. So it's No, no, so we're saying it sifts that which comes before. In that. Okay, so okay, maybe my terminology wasn't precise, yes, I apologize so for that. It means that some things come from some things don't. 
no, no, no. If you get if you get the Bible and you put it through the truth sieve, you'll have the Quran at the end of it. But how do we decide what's true? Yeah, so we would say that since the Bible was preserved, was not preserved, sorry, was not preserved, according to our perspective, there was a need for another revelation to come down which would be preserved, which would which would basically um, reinforce the true parts of the Bible and clarify the faulty parts of the Bible. There's faulty parts of the Bible? Yes, yes. According to the Quran, the Quran is one of the words, of the names of the Quran is al muhaymin wa muhaymin wa alayhi. In chapter 5 of the Quran, somewhere in the 60 or 70 verses, it says that the Quran is a muhaymin on the Bible or on the, um, on the previous dispensation. So in other words, that which we have now of the Bible, you'll find in it things which are true and valid and things which are not. So okay, that's the exact position. This is the question that keeps happening. Yeah. How do we decide what's true and not? I think that's, yeah. what we need. that's the question. Definitely. All right. So you, let me go to your first question and then we'll come to that question. Okay. Right? Because your first question was, what was the beginning? So uh, you know what? I'm not even bothered about that question anymore. Really? I want to know why we decide what's true and what's not. Okay. Well, I, this, the answer to that question will link to this. So let me try and join okay. both together. Right? So we believe that the first, the one and only is God. That in, in a biblical term, he's the Alpha. So he was always there. Okay. okay. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side note, but this is something we'll talk about later. Why did we decide that it was a man? It's not a man. It's not a man. It's not a man. You say him and Alpha. Yes, yes, yes. Alpha is a, it's a biblical term. I said this anyways. So it doesn't necessarily mean... It's not no, like no. The, the word Alpha, not, not Alpha male. The word Alpha, the Alpha and Omega, Alpha means the beginning. Right, okay. Right? Okay. Okay, no, you're absolutely right. God is genderless according to us. Interesting, okay. Right? So, um, in fact, in, the cha in chapter 42 of the Quran, verse 10, it says, Laysa he shay or sami al basir, that there's nothing like him at all and he is all seeing, all hearing. He. The word he is, is in a. It's not, it's it's not in a yeah, so when we say he, once again, yep. it's just the default of some languages. So it's just us that's social constructed. It. Yeah. It be a a ma masculine, word, absolutely. Example. Yeah, yeah. So, but language has to be in co um, basically words have to be in conformity with linguistic norms. So, from an Islamic perspective, um, huwa, which is the third person pronoun which references uh, things, so damir, it is the default. So, in most cases, if you talk about anything, you say huwa. But sometimes that can uh, yeah, it can apply to male and female. Hum can apply to male and female. But anyways, the point being is this. Going back, um, so God was there, nothing else was there. So God created, God created a variety of different things of which the universe was one of them. He, did, he created it with precision and uh, design. Usually when I have this discussion with atheists, I take him the other way around. So I say to them, look at the design, what must be the characteristics of the thing that put this into effect? And they would say to me, well, I had to have intelligence, I had to have the power. Yeah, they would, well, some of them would say that, some of them would disagree as well, right? It would have to have intelligence, it would have to have um, ability to put things into, uh, into, into motion, etc, etc. Because that would be the logically deductible thing that you would infer from design, a designer usually of some sorts. So, unless you believe in randomness, which you can't prove. No, no I don't believe in randomness, I believe in organic uh, energy, which is elements, which is chemical reactions. That's fine. But your question now, which is the good question, question. right? Yeah. No, your question, which was a very valid, legitimate question, was yeah. as follows: You said, "How can we know if something is true?" Yeah. Now, this is my proposition to you. Everything in terms of the disciplines of every single, any discipline this world has ever known, has been criticised from its base, and there, there is faith attached to everything. Even if we're talking about formal logic, and if we're talking about mathematics, and if we're talking about science. We talked about science already, how it's moving forward, and there's problems of induction, and um, theory ladenness, and all kinds of philosophical things which the philosophers of science talk about. In mathematics, uh, Kurt Gödel talked about how actually there are some interesting paradoxes that can be seen in mathematics, and his inconsistent, or incompleteness models. Um, in logic, there have been many that have criticized logic, including Immanuel Kant in 1790, he wrote uh, a critique of pure logic, who he, I think stole from a previous scholar, which is Islamic scholar, even called Ibn Taymiyyah, who wrote a similar book called al Radu al Manataqa, uh, the response to the logicians. Anyways, okay, just everything. Summarize. So we're basically saying within maths, we look at what is 
uh, real, I mean, it's not, and therefore we decide what is true and what is false. What I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is this. I'm trying to give you a true standard of some sorts. What's your true standard? I'm saying that if we wanted to be as skeptical as possible, we can find things um, to criticize every field in the world. And we can find reasons not to believe in maths, not to believe in science, and not to believe in formal logic. Okay, but this is a man-made construction. So how, what are we, we're taking something from a godly word and we're deciding what is true and what is false. But why do we have that right to decide what's true? I'm, like I'm not even, I'm, I don't even believe in the word of God, I'm just trying to understand yeah. what makes us being able to choose and pick from different sources of the right. Bible so, and therefore create yeah. realities within our society. So I will say to you this, I'll say to you there are two things that we inherently uh, use as human beings and I'm sure you use them in your daily life, okay? One is a probabilistic and I'll call it an epistemic, a a probabilistic reasoning. Okay. Okay, an epistemic, um, probabilistic reasoning. Okay, (laughs) what is this? So for example, if I, by virtue of probabilistic reasoning, think that if I, for example, jump up, that I will come back down. Yeah, that would be for me a rational belief to have and I will have that belief. If I jump now, if we jump right, right, right now, that I will not fly, basically, that I will come back down on the earth. I say this because of basically my experience and because of probability, epistemic probability. So that's one of our true standards. So one, we said epistemic probability. Number two, which is for me even stronger than this, is our first person subjective experiences. There are some things which cannot be proven using a third person narrative. So for example, consciousness, the mind, mathematics, all of those things can't be proven using a third person narrative. You can't put my, uh, mathematics under a microscope. You can't put your mind under a microscope and you can't put uh, your consciousness under a microscope. We believe in consciousness because we are conscious. And by the same token, we'll say that Muslims believe in God because we believe that this is an inherent belief. Yeah, so we are, to, to take Rene Descartes' words, born with the signature of God in us. And by the way, there is some sociological and anthropological work that's been done on this. Like, for example, in um, Oxford University, 2011, they said that human beings, and they've done a study on like children, like I don't know how many different countries, but it was a multi-million pound study that was done by Dr. Barrett, uh, something, Justin Barrett or something, is it Garrett or something? I can't remember his name. Point being is that they said, you, doing this uh, multidisciplinary kind of using a multidisciplinary approach and doing the study they said that human beings are inherently believing in a higher being right so the question is how can we uh, explain that so we say this this is explicable because of the first person subjective experience the idea that there is a higher power and intelligence um, that there is some kind of transcendent being that controls the affairs of the universe is something which I would argue is we, we believe Within. naturally until we're socialized to believe in otherwise. Right. Which is exactly what the Prophet told us. He says, I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter about the Prophet because we've already established right. right. something right. that we believe within. Right. From his mind. Yes. And then So, what the Prophets come to do from an Islamic perspective is just reinforce that which you already know. Which is why the Quran is actually referred to one of the names of the Quran is as Dhikra. Dhikra or Dhikr, sorry, Dhikr is basically a remembrance. So it's Dhikr, it's a remembrance, it's there to remind you that which you already know. That's all that the Quranic, or I would even argue all the Prophets came with. Prophets and our narrative, our meta-narrative of religion, came to tell people to believe in the one God, worship in one God, submit your will to that one God, that way you'll be one with nature in that sense. And then, and then after doing that, you can start doing things like giving and charity and fo- uh, following the guidelines of God as per that particular religion. Can we argue that this inner belief is just this natural spirituality that comes within? Again, going back to energy, understanding, consciousness, yes. and then social construct comes later and that's where religion comes in. Well, I mean, you could, you could argue this. You could argue just about anything, right? But the point is, arguments are just words unless they're backed with evidences and evidences have to be probabilistic and all first person subjective in order for us to accept them with the with the problem of the nature versus nurture debate 
which is the debate in philosophy and also psychology, is actually that it's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword because you can never reach the bottom of something. Feminists will come and say, look, it's a social, pink is a social construct, okay? Pink for females is for a social construct. Evolutionists, by the way, so I've, I was reading something, some books that were saying that actually it's not a social construct because they say that when women, when men were hunter gathering and they came back and then women were, and, sorry, he's just, he's just, he's not even a Muslim. Yeah, he's not. Um, and so uh, when they were cutting, like for example, they come with meat and then women would cut, usually cook cut up meat and they see blood so that would become part of their psyche and I've seen weird things written about this but the idea is to what extent is something a social construct is a question that cannot be answered in a definitive way in most cases in a definitive way in most cases right. uh, in some cases you can but in a definitive way it's very difficult so for someone who's uh, uh, secular and anti-religious they'll say listen uh, religion is, a, is the opiate of the masses and it's a social construct the religious person will say actually religion is not a social construct it's a divine thing you have it it's a spiritual uh, first person reality anyways uh, and then we have the arguments back and forth so you can make an argument for or against but you can never get to the bottom of it because i don't think you can reach that kind of definitiveness that we can agree on. yeah <laughs> all right i'm gonna have to go brothers and sisters we have purchased a property to establish a masjid in the capital of norway by supporting our masjid you will inshallah gain the reward for gifting Islam to our community. Imagine the children memorizing the Quran, the lines filling up for the prayers five times a day, the non-Muslims discovering the beauty of our deen. SubhanAllah, all of that reward can be yours for a small donation. Allah said, believe in Allah and His Messenger and donate from what He has entrusted you with. So those of you who believe and donate will have a mighty reward. And the Prophet Wasallam said, Whoever builds a masjid for Allah, Allah will build for him a similar house in Jannah. Click the link to help and gain the mighty reward promised by Allah. Also, please help us reach more people by sharing the video. May Allah grant you a palace in the highest level of Jannah. Amin.